thanks for um, your participation today, um, allowing me the opportunity to share some, some ideas that I have um, developed in my research. The symposium is on new frontiers and directions in Chinese history. And of course, we're speaking from the vantage point of Hong Kong. So what I propose to do in the next half hour or so is to switch our focus a little bit, switch our emphasis a little bit, and think about Hong Kong as the object of analysis. So recent years have uh, witnessed quite a rejuvenated level of interest in Hong Kong. Um, it's, of course, a fascinating site in its own rights, but it's also quite significant in this uh, broader geopolitical um, uh, dynamics uh, of the region and the world. Well, I, I, quite a few of you actually know my personal background. I came into um, Chinese history in a very convoluted way. I grew up here in Hong Kong, and when I was living in America for a long time, I decided to explore a little bit about my culture, and I went back to school, and I studied Chinese history for that, and it was then that I benefited from the mentorship of uh, Professor Kirby, along with my many teachers at, at Harvard. And it was only when I returned to Hong Kong on a fellowship, supposedly just for one year, that I decided to know a little bit more about this place, that is my birthplace as well. And it was at that time that I made the acquaintance of Xu Guoqi at the uh, University Services Center. That was 2010, right? Um, so it's, uh, it's a, a, a strange path that allowed me back into an exploration of Hong Kong. And it's, of course, because Hong Kong went from an education system that boosted the, uh, the headcount of people like myself at places like Hong Kong U, that I managed to find a job, and thanks to Kendall Johnson, who recruited me to join um, the Faculty of Arts at that time. So this is a reunion of sort and bring together many threads of my, my own experience uh, to bear as I think about research. Now, this scholarly focus of mine, this pathway of mine, is actually not that um, unique, I think. Um, what the way we have studied Hong Kong certainly reflects the preoccupations of scholars at, them, at their own particular vantage points and particular moments in time, and the exigencies and practicalities of uh, working in and with China. In my talk, I will try to interlace the histori historiographical trajectory of the study of Hong Kong with the historical developments of the city as well. And hopefully we can explore thereby Hong Kong's opportunities and challenges uh, in our world today. So let's start from more of the earlier studies of uh, Hong Kong. When China was closed to foreign travel, you have earlier scholarly interests focusing on Hong Kong more as a proxy for what's going on in China at that time. Many of my teachers, David Four, um, who has just retired from his position in uh, Chinese U, is certainly a pioneer in that department. And so is our very own Helen Xu, um, who has uh, long-standing interest in the institute. Um, she was also part of the Huanan Xue Pai, the, um, the school of um, studying southern China. Um, that is largely done because we, you know, this anthropological angle you know, somehow has, um, I, I think, um, uh, been, been uh, well deployed, and you have the subsequent re-entry into China that re redirected scholarly um, attention to what was happening in China itself. So then you have a lot of scholars studying Hong Kong on its own because of its own dynamics. Coinciding with that, especially in the years leading up to 1997, you have a lot of local interest in Hong Kong, primarily in more of the cultural sense of the, of the, uh, of the city and how that facilitated exchange um, in and through the city. And many of the uh, recent projects have capitalized on that to think about instrumentality of Hong Kong in directing regional and global flows. You also have this trend of people interested in Hong Kong as part of this collection of cities on the periphery of China. But I think these broad brushstroke actually sometimes can conceal more than it reveals. True, we're all living on the periphery of the big power, but then the dynamics can be quite different. So compared to this historiographical uh, trajectory, Hong Kong owed its geopolitical and economic significance to its role as China's outlet during the Cold War, and the city has found it necessary to refashion itself since China's reform era. So much of the focus is on viability on the periphery, and we explore that through history. But then the, the stories are quite different. Uh, I, I guess it doesn't quite require a lot of explanations how Hong Kong is quite a different story from Xinjiang but also Taiwan too. 
many of the uh, Taiwan, Taiwan scholars looking at the history of Taiwan you know, kept telling me that, oh, we had a whole million people moving from, from the mainland to Taiwan um, right around 1949. As a matter of fact, we did embrace a similar number of people from the mainland here to Hong Kong, but over three decades. So to think about that as a historical process and to appreciate the dynamics that it engenders, I think it's important for us um, to, to take that perspective instead of just thinking about it from our present day uh, focus. And the more recent trend is partly because of a political initiative to think of Hong Kong as part of the Greater Bay Area. So it's not really survival on the periphery, but it's also how Hong Kong and this whole zone can serve as an interface. What I'll hopefully uh, impress upon you by the end of this presentation is that the aggregation of the Greater Bay Area into a single zone does not seem to reflect wisdom from our historical experience. And let me explain why. What Greater Bay Area is a new term. I have studied this as part of the intellectual lineage that um, I belong to as the periphery of the area. And of course, we call it Lingnam as well. So uh, I guess the last one is more of, um, of a definition by um, uh, land formation uh, is south of the passes. Um, the delta um, definition is very much part of a water type uh, water based definition. Whereas the Greater Bay Area, I guess, has been imposed more as a political definition. And now, with uh, great visuals, um, our journalists have come up with great um, pictures telling you about the, the various uh, loci that we should focus on when we think about the Greater Bay Area. So I was just giving a talk in England, so my reference points is to that. The Greater Bay Area is about a quarter of the area of the UK, but about half of the GDP of the UK. And just as importantly, it has 1.3 times the population of the United Kingdom. So great potential, outrageous dynamics. But as we think about this and the development of Hong Kong, let me just dial back a little bit for us and explore the different hubs before Hong Kong. And of course, we're talking about Guangzhou, Canton, Guangzhou, which went by the various names, reflecting the international dimension of the city. And here, I'll show you some pictures of the trade dynamics involved at that time. This is the last quarter of the 18th century. And what I'm depicting here is the export of tea from, from Canton to various parts of the world. Many colors here. You can see that the earlier vibrant colors on the left side of the chart largely disappeared by the end of the uh, 18th century because of continental European conflicts. Many of the greens and yellows and the, and the pink, they disappeared. And in this place was the rising power of Britain particularly the East India Company um, of Britain and its dark blue. What is also interesting is that you have this shade of red that started popping up and occupying a larger space area on the graph. And that's the newly independent United States of America, which then could break free from the um, control of the British East India Company, which had a monopoly on the trade. Dial forward into the 19th century. You have the continued dominance of the British but then the red zone kept expanding. And as I'll explain, it's through this red zone that Chinese trading companies actually managed to break free, at least partially, from the hegemony of uh, the British control at their own port in the Chinese city of Canton. And central to the story, uh, a couple of characters that were, that, that were quite instrumental to uh, my first book. Um, on the left-hand side, you have this Chinese merchant named to the west as Hokwa, Wu Bing Jian. And his trading partner, the Forbes, is actually a whole family complex. It started with John Perkins Cushing, um, and then the, the Forbes brothers. And it was a, a continued presence in Canton at that time that allowed Hokwa to work with the Americans to at least ship part of the Chinese products to markets outside of England, and thereby introduce some leverage to the, uh, to the relationship. Now this all happened seemingly so easily because the Americans spoke the same language as the British. So what the, the language that facilitated the exchange or the transfer was this. I, uh, your American man, pay no, pay, no pay so 
much price for so fashion both he as that English man pay for he both both he. He tea have all same same as first chop Congo tea. I mean it's all gibberish to many of us. And I'm sure linguists will have a field day understanding this form of exchange. But what I'll draw your attention to here is that there is a clear distinction here already of the different qualities of tea and the different classes of merchants, where they are from, the Americans versus the British, and how much they, need, they each could pay for which quality of tea. Now this is Hopas Persa. Let's hear Hopas, his own voice. So he is, he is uh, reporting on what is called a squeeze that the, uh, the, the court was exercising on him have got too much bad news because Yellow River was having another flood. So the Mandarin, the Mandarin, he won chi my two lakh dollar. What is two lakh? Two lakh is 200,000. My pay he 50, 60,000. So instead of paying the 200,000 required, he was paying 50, uh, 60,000. And suppose no contendi, my pay he one lakh. This is a very awkward form of exchange, I guess, especially from my vantage point, having part of my appointment in what is called a school model languages and cultures, we teach people all sorts of languages. <laughs> I guess back then, you could hardly learn Chinese and English, not something that we could quite easily recognize. What is interesting though, as you can see here, and it's back to my, my, uh, my old trick as more of a finance guy, these people knew their numbers better than I did, I do. Two lakh, 200,000, that's too much. I'll pay 50, 60,000. You're changing the number of zeros as the unit of analysis. I mean, I am having trouble with uh, yuan, yi tian, uh, and 10,000, and I'm actually struggling now that uh, many of my, um, my finance friends are, are telling me that it's uh, 10, 10 was uh, sub teen, you know, instead of yat man, it's, it's tens of thousands. I mean, to me, it's all mumbo jumbo, but hey, this, this international trader knew what he was doing at that time. What's his language called? It's called pigeon. It was not called pigeon English. It's just pigeon. And what is pigeon? Pigeon is what we'll consider a corrupt form of pronunciation of the word business. So when they spoke pigeon, they spoke business. And in that sense, well, to know your numbers and to understand how you're trading is a good form of business. Now, I'm only giving you this short overview of what happened before Hong Kong because it's so easy for us to forget the transnational dynamics of this whole space and the Great Bay Area's prehistory, pre-Hong Kong, as China's interface with the rest of the world. Now, what happened to Canton could also be in instructive to our future in Hong Kong, and let's explore why. So in my second book, book project, I dial forward to post World to Hong Kong. Many of us study Hong Kong, and of course Hong Kong is an exciting place for all sorts of reasons, and has a long history than post World War II Hong Kong that I focus on here. But it's in especially important in the post World War II period because unlike the period before it, when Hong Kong was just one of many dots on the map of China, where Western traders, visitors, could land on China, Hong Kong became the only foothold when all the three ports got um, abolished, and especially in the aftermath of 1949. And in my study of, the, of aviation, commercial aviation through Hong Kong, I resist the temptation of looking at it as an inevitable development just because the world was getting more connected. Instead, I argue that this is the process of globalization, global networks in the making, and the uh, outcome was far from being preordained. Um, and again, we used to focus mostly on China and, and Britain, uh, but just as what I showed in the earlier slide about Canton, the Americans played an important role in this as well. Let's step back just half a step into the 1930s. It was a new form of technology, aviation, but then as, a form, as an industry, commercial aviation, Hong Kong was behind, but not that behind. Because as you invent something to make it commercially viable, it takes quite a bit of time. Don't believe me? Ask Silicon Valley. So in this case, it seemed natural that Hong Kong would eventually become an airport, an a, a aviation hub. Why? Because we're a seaport already at the southern tip of China. But then we need to appreciate that in the context of what was going on already 
So think of the inertia of people handling similar businesses, just not in the skies, but perhaps at least in the maritime world. Think of the investment that needed to be made, not just in planes, but also infrastructure, runways, airports, the financing that you need to come up with, and of course, it's all financed by geopolitics uh, that was um, unfolding in the background. So speaking of geopolitics, who are these people who wanted to come to Hong Kong or fly through Hong Kong? Well, you have Pan American Airways, uh, the, the titan from the US, that had already invested in a joint venture in China, CNAC. And Hong Kong was supposed to be the collection point of traffic from China to which they would channel um, aviation air routes to the rest of the world. Who did they want to connect with here? British Imperial Airways, predecessor to uh, BOAC and then British Airways. So by that time, the British Empire might, might have lost some of its uh, luster, but British um, Imperial Airways was eager to connect the various dots on the, um, on the empire together um, through this new form of connection. I'll draw your attention to just, just one thing on the map that you, that you see in front of you. Short hops, because the technology was still relatively new. Planes could not cover long distances. And a couple of th another thing that I would like to draw your attention to is that this old route, or this new route for aviation, followed quite closely the old route of maritime transportation. Because after all, they were connecting the same dots. There were seaports for the British Empire just this time in the skies. So the, the grand entrance finally happened on March 24, 1936. Um, the Dorado of Imp uh, British uh, Imperial Airways uh, landed in Hong Kong, carrying 16 bags of mail weighing 47 kilograms and a single passenger. Well, we would find it strange if we were to uh, go to our new airport at Tekalap Gop and we're the only one on the plane. I, I guess for a while it did happen. Uh, but it's also important to remind ourselves uh, that airplanes, skyways, were just as important in carrying information as it was people and goods. And in those days, it was in the form of mail. Now it's a click away on email, but snail mail at that time, at least air mail, was not that slow. That British Airways or British Imperial Airways had landed in Hong Kong made Hong Kong all the more desirable for Pan Am. And people were speculating that Hong Kong was going to become a big hub in no time. One article reported, few people in Hong Kong realize that the total mileage of airlines in China exceeds that of Imperial Airways. So the emphasis here is not just a connection of Hong Kong to the Americas and Europe, it's also its role as a funnel point for traffic from China. It did happen, but not until after months of negotiation. The colonial authorities didn't quite make it easy for Pan Am to uh, fly through Hong Kong, not for CNAC either. But it finally happened. And the, uh, the, the goal there is to make Hong Kong the air hub of the Pacific. Circumnavigating the globe was the goal. Hong Kong to London, that's Imperial Airways, five days. London to New York, two days. New York to San Francisco, four days. San Francisco to Hong Kong, four days. So in that sense, Hong Kong was to be as important as a critical link as London, New York, and San Francisco. So it's not a surprise that you have newspapers reporting that Hong Kong would become a nexus of civil aviation worldwide. But the next arrival after the Dorado was not Pan Am's flight, but a flying boat of CNAC, the Chinese carrier. Uh, that inaugurated service between Shanghai, Hong Kong, and Canton. The date's November 5th, 1936. Half a year later, the long-awaited Pan Am flight finally arrived. The China Clipper began its flight um, from San Francisco on April 21st, 1937. The destination was Hong Kong, where it was, quote, to connect up with Imperial Airways route, which has its far eastern terminal at that colony. It was not a direct flight. Uh, the China Clipper stopped at many points already. And it was in Manila that another um, aircraft, uh, another plane, uh, took over. No passenger on his first flight either. And the flight, as you can see here, landed in Kowloon Bay, right across the harbor from here. And of course, I'm using the word landed in a very liberal sense, uh, because you can see that it's actually gliding. 
uh, onto the side of, of the harbor, not unlike our Macau ferries these days. Uh, our colonial governor at that time, Smith, um, said, today we welcome the final welding of perhaps the most important link in the chain of world communication. Hong Kong is only a tiny place, but our magnificent harbor has been on the map for quite a long time, harbor. And now is our hope that Hong Kong will be equally on the air map, with London in one direction only nine days away, and of New York in the other direction only six and a half days away. So think of the continuity, um, the harbor, the airport. Pan Am's representative, representative responded, it's significant that today at this magnificent airport in the most beautiful of all harbors, you have witnessed the first direct connection between the surfaces of Pan American and your great imperial airways. So the connection of European traffic with North American traffic, and of course connecting with them, um, Chinese traffic that um, Hong Kong funneled. So it was in this context that um, Hong Kong functioned as an in-between place that connected China to the region and the world. That only happened because of a few factors, uh, many contingencies. One, Hong Kong's status as a British colony, hence you have the, um, the colonial officials in London um, negotiating uh, on those rights. Its attraction to American interests as a focal point in the region, hence you have Pan Am. And just as importantly, its role, its role as China's outlet to the Western world. To your far left, you have this vertical line, basically the, um, the imperial route um, stretch out to what is called the trunk route. The trunk route is what the governing regime um, in an empire or place would consider to be um, of strategic importance, um, commercial value too. I just highlighted for you Hong Kong. It's on a side route. <coughs> unlike Singapore, unlike Calcutta, it was not on the direct route. So is Hong Kong an afterthought? A simple sidebar? Not quite, because it was a placeholder. It was an important placeholder uh, that allowed the British system to construct a vector pointing north, in particular to China. Well, that all happened in the 1930s, and we know what happened, the trouble that uh, brewed after that. But the negotiation for post-World War II aviation happened actually in the middle of World War II before fighting concluded. At odds with one another were actually two allies, um, uh, Britain and, U uh, and the US at the time, because American dominance of the world was to be predicated in the post-World War II period, not on territorial control, but on the access that airways would facilitate. Here in Chicago, 1944, they did not yield, the British did not yield to American demands, but soon enough, two years later in Bermuda, they did. They had to succumb to their, um, their, their, their needs in the post-war period as they reconstructed um, their own um, empire. The British came back to Hong Kong, equally excited about building Hong Kong into an aviation hub. And Kai Tak, which we knew uh, dearly for much of the 20th century, was initially condemned. The British officials had originally concluded that Kai Tak, quote, could never be reconstructed or expanded in such a manner as to conform to modern aviation standards. Where did they propose to build the new airport? Deep Bay. And where's Deep Bay? Straight to the sh south of Shenzhen. It was somewhat problematic because after all, you have a different regime right across um, the border of the Shenzhen River, even at that time. Uh, we know what happened in 1949, but that's going to happen only afterwards. In that period, the British were really excited. You needed, uh, they needed a, a big airport that could really handle traffic. Um, in 1946, the British officials in Hong Kong called um, the city a most important link in the network of post-war aviation. They sent a whole crew, defense, aviation experts, to not just Hong Kong, but the Far East in 1947 to figure out this plan of constructing the imperial network um, in this region. It's in this context that uh, BOAC, the successor to British Imperial Airways, launched a weekly flying boat service in August of 1946, connecting Hong Kong to the UK with a six-day route. Uh, whenever I do that, I remind myself that I shouldn't be complaining about the 10-hour journeys anymore, which was no fun, but uh, six days, I'm not sure if I could do it. Um, and the enthusiasm, uh, well, not mine, theirs, at, in that period of uh, of the potential, the promise of aviation, seemed well-founded. In the year ending March 1949, there was a doubling in the number of passengers through Kai Tak, Hong Kong's airport. 75% to 
to and from China. So this whole promise of China, this whole criticality of traffic through Hong Kong from China seemed just about right. Well, in this context, we had the emergence of not one, but two Hong Kong-based airlines. In the lower panel, you see Cathay Pacific, still the same Cathay Pacific, just different logos, different fonts. It was started by two wartime pilots working in China, one Australian, one American. They soon sold to a consortium led by Swire, the British logistic firm that had operated in this region for quite a while. So think about inertia, think about vested interest and how they deploy their capital to shape um, the industry. Their competitor, an alliance led by BOAC, so the British carrier, in conjunction with Jardim Matheson, a Swire competitor. And that was called Hong Kong Airways. Their deal concluded in 1949, brokered in London, worked out in Hong Kong, was that Hong Kong Airways was going to control all routes north of Hong Kong and Cathay south of Hong Kong, except for a city that now we have forgotten largely, Manila. Uh, that was a shared spot for the both of them. What we know is not such a great deal for um, Hong Kong Airways. Um, Cathay Pacific, on that basis, expanded routes in the region that came to be known as Southeast Asia. Hong Kong Airways, when they started a service to Shanghai, was already not so great not even because of political trouble yet, but because the Republican government was in such a disarray with their finances uh, that the, uh, the carriers, they were desperate for foreign reserve and they were undercutting Hong Kong Airways uh, quite uh, drastically in terms of pricing. And of course, with communist advances, Shanghai was gone and then Canton as well. But then based on the mandate, Hong Kong Airways decided we'll keep expanding north, first to Taiwan and then to Japan and South Korea as well. Well, it was bad timing with communist takeover of China. For the year ended March 31st, 1951, total aircraft mo movement plummeted 76%. Passenger count plunged 74%. Just about right. If you think of the 75% I just quoted you for the year 49, you have the removal of China from traffic through Hong Kong, and that was not even marginally compensated for by traffic that um, rerouted uh, from Hong Kong to Taipei and points north. That endured for 10 years until 1959 when Cathay Pacific took over um, Hong Kong Airways. And from that point on, BOAC basically just remained con in charge of the trunk routes, but then the whole um, pattern of regional traffic, um, they allow Cathay to run on their own. So you have on one side BOAC running our traffic to, to Europe, and then on the other side Pan Am largely responsible for traffic to America. And in the middle was Cathay Pacific running a route that was basically extending from Southeast Asia through a, cor a Cold War corridor that moved from Hong Kong to, through Manila to Taipei up to Japan and South Korea. Well. The colonial authorities, if anything, were certainly pragmatic, and they decided to return to Kai Tak. Not only because of strategic reasons that you have forces that might not be as friendly towards you, um, taking over the area to the north of the Shenzhen River, but you also cannot quite justify a purpose-built airport with traffic that had plummeted. Well, by 1958, so almost a whole decade later, the new runway that you see imagined <laughs> into the, uh, the harbor of Hong Kong got constructed. And uh, the um, governor at the time, Robert Black, said, this is an important step in the development of civil aviation facilities on one of the world's major air routes. Well, major it was because it's strategic and the linkage was important. What about traffic? It was horrible in the early part of the 50s. But Cold War dynamics certainly had rejuvenated interest of flying through Hong Kong so much so that by the early 60s, Hong Kong had basically recovered from the nightmare that it suffered from in the uh, early years of the 1950s. Cathay Pacific also benefited quite um, uh, a bit from it. Um, traffic in that decade quadrupled, and then it extended its reach to Calcutta via Bangkok and many places in Southeast Asia. And this was the pattern that they came up with by the late 60s, early 70s. Of course, this is a stylistic rendition of what they covered. So Hong Kong at that time was very much of a regional hub, certainly a regional hub for Cathay Pacific. 
But because of good investments, both in our infrastructure with the extension of the runway in the, in the early 70s, uh, with uh, the new financial web with all, because Hong Kong was growing economically, um, Cathay was buying 747s that allowed it to leapfrog many of the carriers, so much so that in 1974, first service to Sydney. 1983, direct service to Vancouver. So flexible citizenship didn't happen in a vacuum. This facilitated that. And it was all the more impressive because in the middle of that, they penetrated the imperial core of London, flying direct to London after some struggle. This all sounds great. They broke free from the regional network. But the important development in that period was that China started opening up as well. So you have the emergence of competitors from mainland China connecting Hong Kong with many of, um, of the cities in China at that time, more in, on an ad hoc basis at first. And that's something that Cathay, along with any of the carriers on the other side of the bamboo curtain, was eager to develop. But just as important as the business into mainland China is something that I think we can all appreciate a little bit more of now, airspace. So next time you fly, now we can all be pilots of our own destiny. You just need to stare at the screen uh, during the 10-hour boring ride, um, and you can see the routes. Every now and then, I get worried. I was flying back from continental Europe one day, and um, they were charting our course through Ukraine. So I thought the pilot was going to kill us all. But no, they, they moved it around. But as, as, the, as, the, as the route changes, you can see what can be politically sensitive and what can be politically impossible. And the possibility for Cathay and many of the carriers to fly through Maine and China by the late 70s, early 80s was huge. Huge not just because it saved time, but also it saved a lot, a lot of fuel, and you can extend your reach quite a bit. Well, through a lot of struggle, you, I, I mentioned in the book how Cathay had to rebrand itself politically to make it more Hong Kong. Um, but then Hong Kong in and of itself is also growing quite a bit, as you can see in the aircraft movements that uh, I chart here for you all the way to um, the year after the handover. That's a solid black line. It took off in a huge way in the years leading up to the handover. And I try to um, understand what fueled that traffic. Of course, we appreciate Hong Kong as a British colony and the infrastructure that the, the regime provided. But in terms of um, the, the economic activities that it engendered. It was a solid bedrock of that solid black line that you see in the bottom of the chart. Didn't quite propel Hong Kong into the economic zone that we found ourselves in. What did it for us was at first American exports. You see here the thicker light gray line. And then later, our second wind, trade with China. That's the dotted black line. Everything seemed great. 1997 came, went, and this is usually the picture we have in our mind with uh, Prince Charles, now King Charles, on the right-hand side, and then um, the Chinese delegation on the left-hand side, and Anson Chen smacked in the middle, being so neutral. <laughs> the picture that I would draw to your attention is actually a different one that took place a year later. July 2nd, 1998 the opening of the new airport at Teklap Gok. The planning of this new airport actually predated the negotiation uh, which ended up, which yielded the joint declaration um, in 1984. In total, it cost us 20 billion US dollars and took seven years to construct. To open this gigantic project, we had at hand um, the PRC president, Jiang Zemin, who was here in Hong Kong to observe the first anniversary of the handover. And at that ceremony, our chief executive at the time, Tong Chi Hua, attributed the completion of this airport to, quote, the wealth of the Hong Kong people, their confidence in the future, and Beijing's support. Jiang Zemin had barely left Hong Kong when Air Force One touched down in Hong Kong, the first international flight to land at our new airport, carrying with it none other than Bill Clinton, the first sitting US president to set foot in Hong Kong. And at the dinner that Tong Chi Hua hosted for him at uh, the governor, uh, government house, uh, Clinton spoke of Hong Kong's vital importance, quote, to the future, not only of China and Asia, but of the US and the world as well. 
The significance of this highly choreographed tandem visit of Jiang Zemin and Clinton to Hong Kong on the inaugural day of our new airport was unmistakable. The planning of and funding of Chekhov Gok had transcended political divides. And at least in 1998, the PRC and the US governments had indicated the intention to maintain the criticality of Hong Kong. Dial forward a few more decades again, growth continued. 1997 was not much of a divide in terms of the growth of aviation traffic. Much of it to new destinations in China as well. Of course, you, you would not be able to miss the precipitous drop on, to the right side of the graph, and we know it's COVID. The entire industry, the entire global industry of global, global aviation who proved defenseless in the face of COVID that swept the world in 2020. The industry came to a grinding halt, but it was worse for Hong Kong because every single flight in and out of Hong Kong is cross-border by definition. And as the various regimes try to tackle this issue of COVID by closing down the borders, Hong Kong got hurt disproportionately. So in the year 2020, we had flight, re flight movements reduced by over 60% and passenger traffic by nearly 90%. But the skies are reopening and certain industry players will come back stronger than before. The restarting of commercial aviation will either witness the dissolution of Hong Kong as a regional and global hub, or the rejuvenation of traffic as global circuitries come to be rewired. For the city to remain vital, Hong Kong will have to reassert its function as a regional and global hub especially as shifting to politics and COVID rewiring happens. It could be part of the Greater Bay Area initiatives, but I'll argue that the authorities tend to project an energized landscape inscribed into um, a national history, but the image of the GBA remains largely one-dimensionally administrative. The official approach tends to narrow the differences and integrate the entire, well, entire region but I'm reminded of, um, of Jim Scott uh, of that little college in New Haven, um, his book on mountains and plains. His way of addressing it is plains are where mountainous people come down to to negotiate with the state. And you will draw back to the mountains as you want to excuse yourself from such interactions. Well, the Greater Bay Area had many plains. We had many jurisdictions that became our hubs 19, uh, 1757, Canton became the sole port of call for Western traders uh, that ushered in a whole century of international interface that I started with this presentation with. Of course, 1842, you have the creation of this colony in Hong Kong, which made Hong Kong quite a special place, but it's in the post-World War II period, especially after 1949, that Hong Kong took on new significance. Cold War dynamics, the, Brit the continued British rule of Hong Kong, of course, with the acquiescence of Beijing in the process and uh, economic growth that was underwritten by US on the other side of the bamboo curtain. The hubs in the Greater Bay Area will need to serve different purposes and the jurisdictional boundaries actually do matter. And of course, the roles of the various hubs, be it Guangzhou, Hong Kong or Shenzhen, they're getting redefined. And in Hong Kong, the reception is not all positive be it the Greater Bay Area, or our earlier slogan of Asia's world city, or trying to figure out what it means for Hong Kong to be operating in China, both politically and economically, that's our challenge. Playing out in the skies of Hong Kong, our future pivots on our ability dem to demonstrate yet again Hong Kong's nimble posture and delicate footwork in connecting global powers on the periphery. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John, for, for the wonderful presentation. Um, I won't say too much because we obviously still have Professor Xu's uh, paper and uh, Professor Zhao's comments, but I think uh, the paper did a wonderful job in not only giving us a good introduction to the kind of historical development of the Greater Bay Area, the Pearl River Delta, the Lingnan region, however you want to call it, and Hong Kong, um, but also kind of a wonderful overview of the large body of work that you've done 
um, on the region, be that you know your early work uh, on Hoqua, of course, or later, um, or more recently, um, on uh, uh, on aviation in Hong Kong, obviously, and also sort of more recently, even the uh, efforts that you've led at the Institute on the Delta on the Move project on sort of more generally historicizing the Greater Bay Area. Um, as we only have, I think, scheduled 10 minutes or so to for, for our discussion here, um, I only have two questions. So first of all, obviously you kind of um, anchored your discussion of the historical development of uh, the Pearl River Delta w within your two books. And that's, first of all, we moved to Hoqua, Sino-American uh, trade through the Canton system in the um, early 19th century. And then we moved kind of into the 20th century 1930s to 1990s, and we sort of look at how Hong Kong became, you know, an aviation hub, and as you show in the book, it didn't really, that was not predestined, but rather, you know, there's a lot of shifts and turns that actually lead to it becoming what we now think is rather natural as Hong Kong being sort of a center of aviation. But I wonder, sort of my first question is whether you can fill in a bit in between, because obviously, both in Hong Kong and in China, a lot happens, you kind of, we see the end of the Canton system, you see um, the rise of the treaty port system, we see, uh, particularly I'm thinking of the rise of Shanghai in the late 19th century that becomes sort of another connector that is competing with Hong Kong and pulling away quite a lot of momentum from Hong Kong uh, when it comes to how the world interacts economically with China. Um, and then of course you have you know the rise of high imperialism and then in the early 20th century, sort of a more of a retreat again of, of the foreign power. So I wonder, my first question sort of is, whether you can fill us in a bit in what, what happens between sort of early 19th century and the 1930s. And the second question, I mean, you've already kind of talked about it um, at the end of your talk, but I sort of wonder whether you can take a bit more time to talk about, to look towards the, the future, what we historians don't necessarily like to do. Um, but um, I think what comes out of your work generally, particularly I think in, in, in the presentation, but also in, 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 in your most recent book, you make this point that Hong Kong is constantly sort of tr needing to negotiate between regional forces, global forces, different has to negotiate different global political, b b how to position itself between different geopolitical players, different regimes and so on. And I think you, you, you call it in the book, I the unrelenting rewiring that, that kind of Hong Kong has to go through. So I wonder a bit whether you can talk a bit more about, um, you know, does Hong Kong still have this ability to, um, always find a good position for itself in, in the larger quagmire of, of geopolitics and what this might sort of um, depend on. Uh, and I think aviation in particular has become obviously even more very recently sort of a focal point as to how this actually works. Is Cathay, you know, should it completely shift towards looking at China as its main sort of uh, interlocutor market or um, more broadly? But I think these are sort of the two questions. So one uh, that I have, so one look backwards sort of filling in the the kind of inter the, the period in, in between the, your two focal points and secondly looking towards the future. Great. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for the uh, the comments and the questions. Um, on the first one, uh, fill in a little bit of the period in between. I think it's also instructive for us to look at the process itself. Um, I guess as historians, we make everything sound so natural and preordained um, because we know what happened at the end. But if you, if, as we look at the historical archives, we can sense that the process didn't quite feel the same for people who were there um, at that time. And just give you an example, um, some of the letter exchange that I saw uh, between Hoqua and the Forbes family um, in, the, in the 1840s and the 50s, so uh, this is the period that um, had already started the, the treaty port. Um, they didn't quite sense that Canton was going to decline quite that rapidly. They didn't know that Shanghai was going to be the, the place, and they didn't know how much business they would need to share with Hong Kong. And I think that is something that I reflect on quite a bit related to the second question um, about our future here in Hong Kong and the dynamics in the region. Uh, things just don't happen overnight, or maybe in hindsight they seem to because we write it in a simpl simplified way. But when we are trying to tackle the issue at that moment with uh, evolving geopolitics, it is easy to lose sight of how quickly things can catch up uh, with you. And that was certainly the case with Canton. And I, I actually explored that book partly because of what I worried about in the case of Hong Kong. And in the case of Hong Kong, it's a slightly different process, but I think the, um, uh, the various parties involved were just as smart. Just as the British decided to, to establish a colony, not just you know, at least area in Hong Kong, 
have a place of its own with its own jurisdiction and, 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 and uh, legal infrastructure, um, Shenzhen came to be um, established, smacked in the middle of this region, seemingly out of nowhere as well. And the dynamics that uh, we see, and that's something that I'm working on right now, is that the flow within the Greater Bay Area got to be quite a bit dis disrupted with the construction in Shenzhen because the people who trafficked through the area, who got transplanted into the area, weren't quite the same as the constant flow between uh, Guangdong and Hong Kong. Um, there, there is a fixed quota uh, of people coming into Hong Kong from, from the Cantonese region post-1949, but Shenzhen came out of nowhere. And for the longest time, we didn't quite see that as a rival until possibly a little bit late uh, in many of the areas. So I think that's something that I, I, I think about if I were to connect the two projects and to, um, and to think through the intervening years and what that might tell us about the way we need to uh, project into the futures and to um, safeguard, again, potential um, um, issues. And the issue of Shanghai is also quite interesting. Um, well, after all, our, our bank here was HSBC with an H and an S um, in it, and the S just fell out, um, just disappeared. And I didn't know about Shanghai um, until my own visit to the city quite late in my life, um, actually. And that's when I realized that, wow, uh, we are proud of Hong Kong for sure. But if you were to just look at the sheer architectural infrastructure of nothing but just, just the, the Wai Tan, you see hmm, they, they operated on a slightly different scale. And it's actually not such a surprise that you have a resurgence of economic power in that city when China reconfigured itself again. Now on the second issue of the future, um, let me offer a couple of comments. Um, that's something that I, I, um, I agonize about every now and then as well. Um, Hong Kong has done a beautiful job as being a broker for China with the rest of the world. But brokering does not necessarily give you substance. So it is n not our individual singular concern that you have the rise of the economic power of China, but different places have responded to it somewhat differently. If we were to think of the little dragons, the little tigers, I, I don't know what we call them in English, but anyway, well, you, you, you look at TSMC. You, you look at Taiwan, they have TSMC. You look at Korea, they have Samsung. Uh, you look at Singapore, they have diversified their, their economy in different ways. I'm hard pressed to come up with any industrial production technology that defines Hong Kong, Kong, Hong Kong and I find that to be um, a little bit problematic. So in terms of substance, I think we need to figure out what flows through this city, what we need to um, cultivate so that we have our chaison d'etre economically uh, for Hong Kong's continued importance. And in the case of Cathay, I also find it quite regrettable, um, especially with the recent incident um, of uh, Blankets, carpet, wha whatever, whatever it was. Um, it's a shame. It is a hospitality industry, an industry that strives to connect to. Uh, and just as airlines, Cathay included, hired flight attendants to ca cater to the clientele, culturally, linguistically, um, this whole issue that um, just unfolded the last few weeks um, seem to indicate a relatively narrow world view, not just of the airline, but Hong Kong in particular, or Hong Kong at large as well. And I wonder how we can, um, we can arrest uh, that particular decline in, in the relationship and our sentiments um, of um, Hong Kong with our, uh, with our compatriots on the other side of the Shenzhen border. All right, thank you. Yeah, we, um, we shall indeed see how, how that further develops.